My name is Ricardo. I am a librarian here at the Sacramento Public Library, and I'm excited to welcome you all here for Activate Teen, Art in the Streets and Books for Youth with Robert Luis Trujillo. I'm very excited about this. Um, a couple quick notes. Um, please, if you're in the Zoom room, put any questions you have in the chat. We'll uh, check in on those during the program, and Robert will be happy to answer them. I'm excited to hand this over to Robert Luis Trujillo. Robert, please welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo. So happy to be here. What's up, everybody? Um, just to talk to you all today. Um, I hope everyone's having a good Saturday and got some good food planned for today. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a, a slide presentation with you. Um, lots of pictures and it'll go fast. And if while I'm talking, you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I can read those questions and respond right then and there. And then we'll have some time for more questions at the end. Um, so yeah, what I'm going to do is sh share a screen right now and then share uh, some slides with you so you can see. All right, so uh, my name is Rob, Robert Luther Hill. You can call me Rob, Robert. Just don't call me Bobby. I, I don't I don't love the, the title Bobby. <clears throat> Much respect to Bob Marley, but um, uh, yeah. So I am a father, I have two kids and I'm a husband. And I work in the arts, multidisciplinary artists. I work in visual arts, um, doing illustration, <laughs> uh, murals, public art. And I also am a, a writer. I, I do kids books, both as an illustrator and as a writer. And I'm born and raised in Oakland, grew up in the Bay Area, but I've spent many time, many times in Sacramento at the Soul Collective and uh, checking out my homie Sean Berner and uh, uh, Francesca Gomez up there. So let's get into it. This picture what you see right here is a painting I did uh, last year, um, just a self-portrait. I try to do one every now and then when I get a chance. And then the picture you see on the left is just me working. I was actually working on a, a kid's book in that picture right there. And it's in my studio, which is my, my living room. Uh, so uh, when Ricardo reached out to me about doing this, um, one of the questions he had was about you know public art and young people wanting to get involved. And one of the questions I had thinking back to my youth is, what does public art change anyway? Like, what does it do? Um, does it do anything, at, if, if at all? Um, and that is, that's a tough question to answer. And I think it really depends on who you're, you're speaking to. For some people, it changes a lot and it's impactful. And for some people, it doesn't reach them at all. And when it comes to work that I've done on my own and with my collective Trust to Struggle, we try to reach as many people as possible. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about a specific uh, mural project, and then we'll go into some other ones. So this is a, a place called the Victory Grill. I don't know if any of you have ever been to uh, Austin, Texas, but this is a, a landmark spot in Austin, Texas. Um, and it's been so long since I've been there that I don't recall the exact location within the city, um, but I do know that you know it's a prominent location. So Victory Grill is a place where they, they serve food. They, they have uh, food that they serve there. It's a bar. Um, but more importantly, it's a venue for performance. <clears throat> and when I went there, it was with the Trust or Struggle Collective in 2008. And we went there because we had put out the call to a bunch of different organizations and places throughout the US. We were doing a tour starting in Brooklyn, New York and going all the way to the West Coast, to Cali. And we put out a call to places to paint murals, but not just, you know, let's paint something that looks dope, which of course you wanna make something that looks fresh the main thing was to be able to make some artwork in collaboration with um, the places where we stopped. And so the Victory Girl was one of those places. Um, the Victory Girl is really prominent because it is part of what is known as the Chitlin Circuit. So if you look at the sign on the bottom, and forgive me if this is triggering to anyone who's, who's looking, but there was something called the Jim Crow laws. And the, the, the idea of Jim Crow dates all the way back to, I think it was the late 1800s or something, but it, it has a, its roots in uh, blackface where they, a, a white person pretends to be a black person by putting black makeup on and dancing and kind of being a buffoon or making a, a fool of themselves, you know, trying to pretend like they are black folks doing a particular dance or song or whatever. 
So there were these laws called Jim Crow laws all over the South, particularly. It would have been difficult no matter which part of the US you are. Uh, if you were black or someone who was Mexican, that's why this, this sign says no negros, Mexicans or, or dogs, which is pretty messed up. Uh, but specifically for black folks throughout the US, um, you couldn't perform if you were a musician at any old location. So if you were thinking about the biggest venue that's in Sacramento or for me in the Bay Area in Oakland, you couldn't just perform there. You would have to go to um, uh, another location and perform at a usually smaller venue, but sometimes equal size, but usually smaller. And black folks weren't allowed to go to those other venues. A lot of people of color weren't either. And so the reason I put this here because it has something to do with the history of uh, the Victory Girl. Because the, if you look at this, this image on the left, this is not the Victory Girl, but this is an, an example of a performance during that time in the, I would say this is probably like the, the 40s or 50s right here. Um, and then if you look at the map on the right, it shows you a bunch of stars um, in the South and in the Midwest and on the East Coast. Those stars are, are cities where people like James Brown um, who was, you know, a, a really prominent musician in both soul and funk and had a huge um, influence on musicians of all colors and types throughout the world. But people like him and his band uh, would get in a bus, they would take all of their, their, their crew, their, their band members, all of their gear, their roadies, and they would hop on the bus and they would travel from you know one part of the US to the other performing in these venues that were a part of the Chitlin circuit. And a circuit basically just means a, a tour, like a route for your tour. Um, and so when we got the call to hit up um, the Victory Grill, it was because it was in danger of being um, shut down. It was a group of people, the owner and other people who love it and have a, a history with it we're trying to keep it alive and designate it as a historical landmark and so when we got to paint this mural there that was a part of you know assisting they were going to get that done no matter what but i think going there and being able to paint the mural and uh, add to the historic the historicness of this place was really important and the reason why i say going back to this this question what does public art change I think it changes the perception for some people who are in the city and didn't know about it to go and say, you know, what is this place all about? <clears throat> the people who are in the neighborhood, the people who grew up going there knew about it, but for folks who didn't, um, it was to add a little bit to it, is to to give to their um, to their campaign, which was already going. We we didn't start it, they did, but we got to contribute to it, and so. One of the things that makes it uh, possible for a place like the Victory Girl to be um, destroyed or, you know, erased is two policies. And when we think about racism in the in this country, a lot of times the argument tends to come down to, well, I'm not racist. I'm not someone who's, you know, saying something negative to you or it's not about between two people what is really lacking in that larger conversation is the understanding of systemic racism. And a system is basically a, a whole thing from start to finish that will guide a process or um, a foundation. That's not a, the greatest definition, but uh, most people, you can understand what a system is. And so here are two factors that led to the Victory Grill being targeted as a place to for them to get rid of in the city of Austin. One is redlining. So if you look on this map here on the left, this is a map of Sacramento. The, the parts that are green, those are the areas that are designated the most, um, the, the most uh, desirable for people to live in. <clears throat> Blue follows it, then yellow, and then the last one, the places that are least desirable are red. And when black folks and people of color wanted to go to a, a bank or a, a mortgage lender to get a house or to start a business, a lot of times they wouldn't have the capital or the money. So they would have to go to the bank and say, let me get that bread so I can get my house or I can open up this spot, like the Victory Guild, for example. And if you lived in an area where there was red, basically they took a red market and drew a line around the areas where most of the black folks or Mexicanos or people of color were, you couldn't get a loan. So that is a, it's not just hearsay, that is an actual fact of uh, US uh, law all throughout the US that kept people from it basically kept people segregated. 
the other picture that's to the right is something that's called eminent domain. And that's the one I know a little bit less about, but basically it's a, a term that a city or a state will use to be able to get land that they want, whether that be for developing a freeway or you know, a new district or a, a ballpark, as in the case with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, so many people have used that to be able to get land. So these are beyond just people who may not like black folks individually or people of color, there are actual structures and laws that are set up to um, disadvantage people and to exclude them. And so when we did that mural, this is part of the, the mural painting right here. We wanted to, you know, learn about this thing. And we, I don't know if we all, some of us knew about it at the time, but we got to get a little bit of game from the owners and say, you know, Ella Fitzgerald perform here or BB King perform here. These are names that became the foundation of what is jazz and rock and soul, uh, so many different genres from the African-American community. So what you see in the, in the mural here is um, it was yellow and then we got to paint and we chose to do um, kind of like sepia tones with little pops of color here and there. And it, it says the Victory Grill presents and on the, <coughs> the bottom, you can see some people standing to, next to what is a, a jukebox because many of these uh, venues um, were also juke joints where they would have a machine back in the day before a DJ, you'd have a machine that played the records. And then uh, on the image on the top left, you just get to see some imagery of, of some of the singers, some of the performers, and then um, just some, some proud imagery of black folks. Now the, the image on the right, this is a plaque. This is a historic site for, for Motown, which is uh, in Detroit, Michigan. But what the Victory Girl wanted to do was to get something similar for their location so that it couldn't be torn down. It, it, once it's designated a, a historic landmark, they, they can't mess with it or it would be much more difficult to, to mess with it. So the mural was impartial to be able to help them uh, prove to the, to the city and to get people rallied around and say, hey, this place is important, we wanna keep it. And so, when I ask the question, what does a mural change? I'm hoping that it changes the minds of people. Uh, it changes the course of, of a campaign or it uh, changes the visual landscape of, uh, of a city. Because if all you see is advertisements, sometimes that can be you know, detrimental to your mental health. So here are a couple other murals I got to work on um, after that. The one on the top left is uh, a mural basically welcoming young people into the West Oakland Youth Center here in, in Oakland, California. And this is a place where people could come and dance. They could come and perform poetry, or music. They could make their own music. There was art classes there. There was a daycare there. It's still there right now. And we did this mural over the course of, uh, I wanna say two years where we got to meet with the, the organization who was spearheading it and meet with the people who are going to be working there um, and meet with people in the community, in the neighborhood. Um, not just come up there and say, hey, we're just going to paint something that looks dope to us. Um, let's meet with folks and see what do they have in mind. And through a back and forth of meeting with people, that's how we came up with the, the artwork for this front. And there's more to it, but I just wanted to show that that main part. The, the one that's to the right, this is in a bakery and a Palestinian restaurant from a friend of ours named Reem Asil in Oakland, California. The restaurant is no longer there as it stands here in Oakland, it's in San Francisco now. But this mural got a lot of flack. You can't see it that well, but there's a, a button of Oscar Grant who was murdered by the police there. And then this, this woman who is in the, the mural, her name is uh, Rasmia Ode, and she was an, an activist from the Palestine who did work in uh, Chicago, I, I believe. And there were people who found out about it because she was, I believe, convicted of, um, of a crime, a terrorist crime. but. She was uh, like so many people who are in the justice system coerced and forced to, you know, say I did this or that. And I think she said that she actually did not do it. Anyway, we, you know, stand in solidarity with the people of Palestine and their struggle for liberation. And so when we did this mural, um, you know, we caught some flack for it, but really the, the owner of the restaurant caught the most flack. Um, but for people who didn't really know, anything about her or Palestinian food or Palestinian culture, it got them to ask the question, who is this person? Let me look them up, whether I agree with it or not. And so another, just going back to the, the West Oakland one on the left, one way that a, a mural can change things is by welcoming people. Another way is to get them to ask a question and to honor someone who is a, a social justice fighter or someone who believes in 
social justice. The bottom left one was created um, in the summer of 2020 after the George Floyd trial. Um, and there were, if you were in the Bay Area, I'm sure that I believe this happened in Sacramento as well, but there were tons of murals going up, tons of people, and this was really beautiful to see, tons of people responding to the, the moment with messages that were, you know, about abolishing the police, messages that said, you know, get rid of them altogether, um, messages that were affirming Black life, messages that were angry at the, the system, which um, targets Black people and people of color in this discriminately um, both for, for murder and punishment. And so when I got to do this, when I got to collaborate with another artist named uh, Benta Oyefem, and she, I'm saying her name wrong, but Benta is her first name. Oyefemi, I believe is her last name. And I got to take an idea that she had basically affirming black lives and talking about reparations and then paint it. And so this was in downtown Oakland and it was up for quite a while. And it, and it was really for me to reflect some sense of uh, joy, some happiness, some uh, pride back to the people. And it was amongst many, 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 many murals out there at the same time. And so one other way that a mural can um, change things is by reflecting the people around you and the visual landscape, whether it be in a dark alley or in the city center or under a freeway underpass is important because those things, you know, affect us mentally and physically, but also they, they teach people. So I hope that, you know, everyone can understand that. And please feel free if you have questions while this is going to write them in the chat. Okay, so one of, one of the things that will happen often if you're a, a creative person or an artist is you'll think, okay, I can't get the funding to do this, or they won't let me in this venue, or they won't let me do this. Basically coming from a place of like trying to get permission. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, one of the first kids books that I did. It's really important to not wait for permission, not wait for someone to give you the green light, not wait for someone to give you the funding, even though those things can be really uh, important and helpful. It's important to like take the initiative and do your thing regardless of what they say. So for me, when I started doing kids books, my son was the initial inspiration behind it because I wanted him to, you know, I wanted him to be able to read books about kids like himself. And this on the right is my daughter. This right here, um, these are a couple of pictures of people who I look to for inspiration when it comes to or movements that I looked to for inspiration when it came to doing my kids book, which was something that was self-published, meaning there wasn't a company behind it making it for me. I, I made it with a team of people. The, the, the image that's on the top left is a, is a band that's called Death, and they were based in, uh, I believe it was Detroit. They were one of the first bands um, doing what we know of as punk music. And punk today gets thought of as like a, a white music, and it's, I would say, predominantly white but it is, has its roots in you know, black music and that's where it comes from. And people, you know, there's lots of arguments about that. There's, there's bands that go way back in Peru and other parts of Latin America. There's uh, bands in the UK. The, the origin is not that important, but I just wanted to show this picture of death because at the time they didn't get put on. They didn't get a lot of notoriety. People didn't like their name. People didn't always understand the music. And so I say that to say to you, people may not get what you're doing, but stick with it, do your thing. The image on the right uh, and on the bottom is of a, a Bay Area legend known as E-40. And I know some people who listen to hip hop up there know who E-40 is. Um, the top right image of his, is of him holding CDs that he printed himself. And this is, I believe this picture was taken in the early nineties, maybe 91, something like that. But this brother started basically him and his brother and his cousins selling their CDs themselves. They didn't wait for a company. They didn't wait for somebody to give them permission. They probably approached people, but they were all like, I don't get it or no, I don't have the time. And so they said, well, you know what? We're just gonna do it ourselves. And so they, they first recorded their music. They got it printed. They got it mastered, all that stuff. And then they started taking those CDs um, not just here in the Bay Area, but all the way to the South, all across the US, uh, places like Houston, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, but all over the Bay. 
and selling their music and kept pounding the payment until they built their audience. Um, so E40, the hip hop community in general in the Bay Area is a big inspiration for me in terms of like doing it on your own and like making it happen. The, the bottom, bottom left in, image that's right there is a place called Gilman. It's in Berkeley, California. And I don't know if it's the band Operation Ivy, but you see their, their banner behind them. And this is a, a historic venue in the punk world where kids who had a name or who didn't really have a name at all could come and play music for one. Kids of all ages could go there. And the, re the reason why I put that there and it says make, make your venue is because you want to, again, not wait for people to give you the props or the green light or the money or the permission, none of that you need. What you need is to get together with your people and do your thing. And so this venue right here is really important because it, you know, people could come together and like play what they wanted to play. Even if adults didn't understand what they were, the music they were doing, they got together and they did their thing and they made this venue a historic landmark still today. Um, and then the bottom right image of E40, believe me, I'm not trying to condone violence. The gun is a symbol for um, being able to protect your own integrity, meaning like you're not going to try to do what the powers that be say you should do, meaning you protect your art, your venue, your form, whatever that may be. So I took this energy with me when I went into children's books, and now I've I've worked on many different kids books. If you see the image there that says for cons first, that is the image of a book that I, when I decided to do my thing instead of reaching out just to the industry of the kids book world, that is the book that really catapulted me for one to understand the craft, you know, the artwork to really get down on, you know, both writing and illustrating, but also to understand the ins and outs of the business and what it takes to make a good book. And so you know, you might have a, a middle finger to the to the system or the powers of be and say, screw you all, you all, but you do have to work on your craft, whatever that may be, work on your stuff. And so when I decided to do that book, I wasn't getting any looks from the industry. I wasn't getting any love. I wasn't getting any interest at all. Um, and I was going to them trying to get permission. And I decided, you know what, screw this. I'm just going to do it on my own, which I did. Um, and actually, crowdfunded with a whole bunch of people who, who helped to make that book. And then once I made that decision is when, you know, I got my first, you know, deal from a company and started to get um, interest from other people wanting me to illustrate their books. And the one that's to the right that says Alejandria Fights Back, this is the most recent kids book that I've done. And I've worked in picture books, which are for kids who are like four to eight and middle grade, which is like kids who are in elementary school and getting into uh, junior high. And for me, children's books, although they may not be on the top of most teenagers' minds, but for me as a, as a young father, I was 24 when I, you know, had my first kid, they were really important because they are a reflection of, of me. Yeah, I didn't see very, very many reflections of myself in that world. And so to be able to make uh, a kid's book about, you know, a kid like myself or like my son or like kids that, that we know was really valuable and important. And although the, the industry didn't get it, once it was out there in the world, I started to get feedback from people who were like excited to see it, excited to read it. Um, so yeah, and then that book there that says Alejandria Fights Back, that book is about um, that book is about evictions and displacement, which so many people, I'm sure, in Sacramento and all over the world are feeling where people are being kicked out or displaced from where they live. And uh, race and class has a lot to do with that. And the book is about this young child, Alejandria, fighting back and saying, no, I'm not going to take this. And if you, if you see a lot of these books are both English and Spanish, because that's also important to me as well, uh, bilingual books so that you, you know, two different cultures can learn something about themselves. This picture that you see right here is another addition to, you know, can, can I do anything with my ideas. What, what can I do that's going to impact people? So beyond just making the kids book myself, um, I decided to link with a bunch of other kids book creators who were both in the industry and self-published and to make an event where not only could we sell our books and, you know, get them to people, but we could invite other people who are doing similar things 
to bring theirs as well. So if you see on the bottom right, I am the one wearing the purple shirt, I'm holding my book. And then the people around me are, some of them are the organizers of the event and some of them are the participants. And we all had books that we weren't necessarily getting love from the industry for the most part, but were making anyway and deciding to share them with parents, with teachers, with librarians, with um, the, the greater community in the Bay Area. If you see on the left, the picture of the, the parent and the child, they're just, you know, getting a chance to meet people face to face um, who they might not get a chance to see otherwise. And these independent creators would bring their books. Sometimes they would bring extra things um, and they got, they got to get the chance to talk to people and say, this is my story and this is, this is what it's about. And that was really powerful because it wasn't just about me, it was about our community. And when we all worked together, um, we made the, the, the voices, the, the diversity of stories rise as well. Um, and if you look at the, the picture at the top light, uh, excuse me, the top, the, the panoramic picture, that is a, a panoramic picture of the venue. And on the stage was this group called Alphabet Rockers from the Bay Area who make music for kids that is social justice oriented, but also very much, um, you know, critical thinking oriented and, and about having pride in yourself and, you know, what you believe in. And so just taking a look at that image, you can see there was a lot of people there. There were little kids, there were grandparents, there were aunties and uncles, there were people who were booksellers, there were librarians, educators, a whole bunch of different type of people came to this event. Um, and that was the first one. We this, this year is gonna be the, the fifth one. But um, I'll just use that to say that when you're feeling like there's no way for you to do your, your thing or you to make an impact, DIY. DIY basically means do it yourself. So learn your craft, get down to your thing, have fun with it and get busy, do it. DIT means do it together. So if you see I'm here with all these other people, you're not alone. There are other people like you, no matter how obscure or, you know, off the beaten path your, your thing might seem. So I'm just gonna stop really quick and see if there's any any questions in the chat. Um, I don't see any questions, so I'm going to continue. And again, if you have questions, please feel to put them in the chat or send them to um, Ricardo. All right, and just hang on one second. All right, so back to this question. So what can I do to make an impact? So whether it's, you know, this, this case of a kid getting off for, for shooting people at a protest, or whether it's, you know, police murdering or committing violence to black people and to the black body, whether it be um, people's lack of understanding or respect for people who are gender non-conforming or non-binary, uh, whether it be sexual harassment and, and rape culture, you could be really pissed off about some of these issues and you could just wallow in that anger and then just, you know, lash out. But when you start thinking like, what can I do? Like, I, I want to do something. I want to take this energy and create something with it. What can I do to make an impact? Again, this goes back to do it yourself, meaning like think about what skills you have, what talents you have and make something with it. That could be an article of clothing, it could be a shoe, it could be a painting, it could be a song, a poem, it could be a building, whatever it is, work on your craft. Uh, don't wait for someone to give you a permission and get to it. Um, the thing that separates you from people who are just thinking about it is you actually working on your craft. And then find your tribe, find other people that you can work with, do it yourself and do it together so that you're working with other people. Most importantly, take the, the thoughts or the, the things that are coming to you in that moment of anger or frustration, or maybe it lingers even after something traumatic has happened and start, you know, enter. I made this illustration um, after some protests because I, I feel like I just wanted to say to people like, you don't have to have the greatest idea. You don't have to be the most skilled person. You don't have to be coming into this fully formed. It takes time, but just start. 
start somewhere. Um, it doesn't matter if you start today or tomorrow or a week from now, but if you feel impassioned, if you feel like you have something to say, we need to hear that. We need to hear from you. So please start. So this picture that I have right here is of a group of people that I started with, and it's called the Trust Your Struggle Collective, TYS. If you've ever been to the Soul Collective, um, Sean, I believe Miguel Bounce, I think they, they did this mural that's on the outside of the heart and the flowers and all that. But this is, I would say 60% of the crew. And then if you see in the picture of all of us on the left, um, Estela, who was uh, the founder of the Soul Collective with Anand, uh, she was just jumping in there to take a photo with us. And we've been able to do a couple of art shows at the Soul Collective in Sacramento, which is, you know, family, you know, they, they support us and we support them in so many ways. Um, this picture on the, the right is funny because it has Bernie Sanders in it as well. But again, build, you know, get down, do your, do your thing, do your idea, do your craft, do what it is that you want to do. Get as specific as you want to, even if you think other people are not going to understand. And then start finding other people who rock with it, people who understand it, people who, who want to be doing the same thing as you. And then share, build, build with them, like exchange ideas, exchange techniques, exchange styles. And from that, you make both of your ships rise, so to speak. Uh, I'm gonna look and see if there's um, some stuff in the chat really quick. Anybody has a questions? So Ricardo says, you make art, poetry, all of which is in support of community building. Did you imagine doing anything like this when you were a teen? No, not at all. Um, when I was a, a teenager, I was I was angry. And the thing that was my outlet at the time was graffiti art. And so using spray cans, using markers, um, writing on walls, writing on buses, uh, and writing on my sketchbook and in my, my home mostly, um, graffiti art was what really inspired me. And seeing artists take that art form and use it to speak about something not just their themselves or their name, but getting up and talking about a message, whether that be police brutality or sexual harassment or some of those other things that I already said. Um, graffiti art was what really inspired me as a teen. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. It wasn't until I, I got a little bit older and understood what I liked doing art wise and what I wanted to say together. And like I said, it, it takes time. So give yourself time. So here are a couple of uh, more ideas when it comes to, to murals or your artwork. So one, this mural on the, uh, excuse me, this image on the top left is a, is a mural that we painted of Trayvon Martin. And it was a collaborative piece with, um, there was many of us there, uh, Aaron Yoshi, Bounce. Um, there was my homegirl, Cece Carpio. There was um, Dignidad Rebelde, Ori, Original. Um, there were so many artists that came and got down with us and painted this collectively. And, and I was there painting as well. And this bottom left picture you see there is me hugging my son. We were just, you know, having a hug, but um, he wanted to paint on it too. He saw it and he understood the times and he wanted to paint on it as well. And so, you know, if you, if there's something going on that you're pissed about, reflect the times. But um, also I want to encourage you to imagine the, the future or the events or the topic or the things that you want to talk about um, on your own, imagine what you want to see. And so if you look at the top right, this is an altar. Um, ben Rojas, uh, Mincho Vega did this um, with the collective. And we had this show, if you see on the bottom right, that's called uh, Celebrate You. And basically what we did was we took pictures of people both alive and passed away who inspired us, inspired us artistically, politically, um, so many different ways. And we painted portraits of all these different types of people. And a lot of them were in the Bay Area or like Estella's in the middle there in that portrait uh, in Sacramento. But some of them were um, international in other countries as well. And so it gave us a lot of um, strength, the things that they do, the things that they, they say. And so we just wanted to celebrate them. And so we invited some of those people to come to the show. Some of them, we gave the paintings to them. And in this altar that you see on the top right, we honored some of the people who had passed away and um, some of the people who had worked with us. And so get angry, 
get upset, you know, that's, that's righteous, you know, but also imagine the future you want to see. Uh, you can reflect the times and also imagine what people may not be talking about. Um, and then <clears throat> this is for when you're, you're starting out again, you know, pick, pick your craft. Like, what is it that gets you the most hyped or what are you the best at or what do you want to learn? Here you see some, some cats rhyming there on the microphone. That's um, Tyler, the creator, and um, Earl Sweatshirt. And then on the right, you see some uh, indigenous folks in Guatemala. They're, they're making these, you know, embroidered shirts. I believe it's called a wipi. It may be a different word in Guatemala, but <clears throat> they're, they're putting their, their talent to use making something. On the left, <laughs> you see an athlete getting ready to run, or maybe they, this person just finished their run. In the middle on the bottom, you see someone coding, you know, putting their fingers to work coding. Um, that could be for an application, it could be for a website. So many different things that we use now today in technology uh, involve coding. And then the, the bottom right is someone, you know, directing with film cameras and audio equipment. And I'm just gonna pause again to see if there's some, uh, some questions in the chat. Uh, someone's saying this is amazing. So thank you for, for listening, for watching. Um, just one last, one last thing before I share some more artwork. This image on the left here is of Princess Nokia. She's an MC from New York, from the Lower East Side, I believe. Um, she's Afro-Latina. I believe she's Puerto Rican, but I'm not going to say for sure. And then on the right is Cardi B, who's also from New York, from the Bronx. She's Afro-Latina as well. The images on the left and the right, you know, are two people who are really talented in music. And then if you look at the bottom, there are images of each one of them performing, you know, and there's people juiced, you know, people excited, you know, taking pictures, taking video. And the reason why I put this here is because there may be some people who say like, you're not a professional, like you're not as big as, you know, this person, like, what do you think you're doing? Like people who are doubters or people who don't understand. And I got to tell you, by seeing people who are professionals and people who are in the underground, quote unquote, whether that be in music or some other form of art, it don't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, one might have more fame and notoriety, but when it comes down to making art that means something to you, when it comes down to making an impact in real people's lives, it doesn't matter. What really matters is you getting down on your craft, doing it, and you know, sharing, reaching people. And I don't, I don't put these two there to pit them against each other. I just put them as examples of two people with similar paths, different levels of, you know, people's awareness, but both rocking, both doing their thing and like affecting people in a good way. So if people start hating when you, when you start or like giving you some flack, pay them no mind. All right, so how do you make art that, that heals or unites? Um, I think it, it really comes from the heart. It really comes from, from your personal experience. That is what is genuine. When people see you being genuine, um, that, is, that is what people, I think, respond to in my experience. Um, and then unite, that is, that is a tough one. I, I would put that question to you, the, the people who are, are listening and watching, you know, what do you think? What do you think makes people unite? I'm gonna check again and see if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, when did you start connecting with mentors as a young person? This is a great question. So, and I'm gonna show, his, this is some more examples. You, you saw the Black Lives mural already. Uh, for me, first I had mentors from afar. So I would look at people like uh, graph writers like Dream and Spy uh, or like uh, Toons and Rifa or um, Crayon um reminisce lady pink like so many different graffiti artists and i i didn't know them personally i just looked at their work from afar and got inspired so that's one form of mentorship you know look at who's doing their thing in your field and study them try to re reverse engineer what it is that they're doing um that was my first you know way to start i guess getting some form of mentorship 
and especially back then because there were no classes for graffiti you couldn't go to a, an organization or an after school program and learn it you had to learn by doing it yourself or by finding other people like you who were doing it um as i got older i started to meet some of these artists that i admired and you know they would drop some jewels they would like give me some advice or they would, you know, give me some words or sometimes even collaborate with them. And <clears throat> I think the way that you start to find mentorship is by doing the work. That means, you know, drawing, painting, singing, building, whatever that is, like the when you do the work and you put it out there and you share, people take notice. And so the more you do that, um the stuff that you're comfortable with sharing you know sometimes you may just be starting your craft and you don't feel comfortable sharing but when you do share it and you'll start to meet other people and game recognize game basically meaning like people who are doing their thing and they see you doing your thing are going to reach out and um you know if not give you a compliment at least say hey i see you um so in the case of of spy for example spy is someone who i've had a chance to you know watch from afar and meet and collaborate with and I, I can call him up and ask him now but I, I couldn't as a kid and it just it just takes time you you meet mentors as you go so yeah these are some some walls that I've worked on the one on the right is from the La Pena Culture Center a long time ago uh, the one in the middle is from an organization called Chapter 510 uh, we already talked about the one on the left the one on the bottom left is um, CC and uh, Tommy Wong here in um, Oakland, California organized something when the height of like Asians being uh, attacked in Chinatown in Oakland and just tried to, instead of going with the media's line about black folks attacking Asian people, which there were people of all kinds, mostly white folks attacking Asians, um, to basically show some unity between black and Asian folks um, because there's a history there. Uh, the, the bottom middle one is a mural that we painted for a community organization in Sunnydale Projects in San Francisco. And then again, the bottom right one, the West Oakland Youth Center, which we talked about. Um, here's some, some illustration work that I've done. And um, these are partially characters, like character design, you know, where I'm thinking about stories or animation or film uh, or just drawing for fun. And then these other images are uh, politically related, like the brown berets in the middle, uh, the EZLN from Chiapas, Mexico in the bottom, and then uh, when the Mike Brown verdict was happening in 2014 on the left. So please look up these, these names if you're not familiar with them. Um, one of the ways that um, I continue to, to get better or try to improve in some way because you never want to be satisfied with your work um, or decide like, that's it, I'm, I'm dope, I'm, I'm great, is to uh, do art challenges or to challenge yourself. And so uh, for Black History Month and for um, Asian American Heritage Month, I do these paintings. And so the one on the left is of Spy, which I mentioned. Um, great, incredible graph writer, great human being. And then Denise Oliver Velez, who's um, uh, African-American activist, um, this woman in New York, who was a part of the Black Panther Party and the um, the Young Lords Party in New York, which is a mostly Latino organization. Here's some more artwork for uh, organizations. So I mentioned in, in the beginning that I do illustration and these are for different organizations or um, institutions. The one in the middle is actually for the Oakland Public Library. And yeah, that's that's some of the work. Um, if you enjoy this, please holler at me on Instagram. Um, this is my page, so you can check it out. It's uh, at Robert underscore T-R-E-S. And that's my email and my website. So feel free to get at me, um, ask some questions, or just say hello. I'm going to check out the chat once again to see if there's any other questions. Um, so the next question is, what is the most surprising thing that thing about being an artist, author, activist that most people don't realize. Um, I think one of the most important or surprising things is like how many people don't take breaks and don't take care of their their health. And so a lot of people will burn out and say, I'm not doing art or anymore, or I'm not going to organize around a particular issue. Um, 
and it's important while you're doing your thing while you're sticking it to the man or or whatever to take breaks take care of yourself take a walk eat healthy sleep um check in with your health provider or local healer um talk to people you know if you're going through some rough times don't just hold it in have conversations with people who you trust and that is to take care of your mental and physical health uh and when you when you've done that when you are good then you can really make an impact if you're if you're doing crappy mentally or physically there's not much you can do for for yourself or your community or the people or your family so just make sure you take care of yourself um the next question what self care tip <laughs> would you give to youth i would say um and especially during this age of like everything being online try to make friendships whether it be online or in person um and build friendship with people that you can trust and like allow them to confide in you and confide in them basically like share you know um i know that's difficult online but like try to build with people who are good folks and um you know become support networks for each other that's what i would say um i know this is difficult cuz i have a, a teenager as well and it's it's hard especially during um quarantine but um the next question being what projects would you see yourself working on in 5 and 10 years so one thing that i'm doing right now is uh, an art book i'm crowdfunding an art book on kickstarter that's about um basically showing some of the inner workings of like an illustrator or an artist mind where you get to see finished and in progress artwork um and i've been wanting to do that for a long time so that you know so many times when i read to kids they love seeing the process they love seeing my sketchbook and all that stuff and so it's really awesome to take that and have a way for people to take it home and and just kind of see some process um in the next 5 or 10 years i want to be able to make more murals for sure um i want to make you know art shows like immersive experiences that people can come to um and experience things um i want to be able to get into film and stop motion animation those are some of the things that come to mind and i'm 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 open you know i'm open to new experiences so yeah any other questions um so the next question is what are your top 2 artists um actors writers you would recommend to teens um that's a good question um there's a young woman named uh wolfpack uh rachel i think it's wolfberg i can't remember her last name but wolfpack she's a really great muralist um i think she's based in oakland but she's done some work you know all over she's a really great muralist worth checking out um there's a mc by the name of classy k l a s s y from la who i got a chance to meet from echo park she's really dope both as a a musician and also you know what she's saying in terms of activism um those are the two that come to mind right now so classy and wolfpack you can look them both up on um instagram and then someone else has a question says hi this presentation is wonderful sorry i'm late um i worked with with the department of education migrant education office and wanted to see if you would be interested in joining us as a judge for a art logo contest sure uh you can you can hit me up i'm i'm not that great at logos but i'm sure i'll i'll be down um and then <laughs> tell us about joy so my my wife joy she's a a graphic designer she works for a company called uh design action collective and it's a, a cooperative meaning there's no one boss everyone is an owner and they they all share decision making responsibilities and have different roles when it comes to making art and they make a lot of work that is um both helpful and beneficial and empowering for political and uh social justice movements oh <laughs> the the question is about joy the concept um the concept of joy i i think is basically um you know what is what brings you happiness and you know if if i was a dj i'd be i'd be thinking about uh collecting records or you know collecting vinyl and i the reason why i use that analogy is because i'll look for some records in house music or i'll look for some records in hip hop or i'll i'll look 
for different sounds and different genres and different artists. And if I was going to play that music out loud, which make, makes me happy, it's a collage or it's a, a, a quilt of all those sounds. And I think to find, <laughs> to find joy, it's important to do that with, um, you know, articles of clothing or, or films or, um, you know, whatever it is craft wise that, that makes you happy. Um, I find that it's, you know, it's joyful to be able to collect things that really inspire you and share them with people. Um, yeah, so that's, that's it pretty much. That's, that's my artwork. Um, that's a little bit about, you know, getting involved and making artwork that has some element of social change to it, or basically joining movements that are already happening and contributing to them with your artwork. Um, and it's been a pleasure speaking to you all. It's been a, a pleasure just uh, hearing the questions and um, really honored to be here with you all. So thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Sacramento Library. And thank you all of you for, for listening. Thank you so much, um, Robert. We're so, so uh, privileged and honored to have you here with us. Um, it's a powerful presentation um, on your work and the communities that you're a part of and the communities that you support. So um, on behalf of the Sacramento Public Library, uh, I want to make sure that you are all aware uh, Robert has books in our collections, uh, so check them out. Um, a lot of the authors and writers um, and musicians that um, Robert mentioned are also in our collections. So there's some a, a lot of good opportunities to um, check in on some of this artwork and some of this community building that um, we've been introduced to today, because I know I have been too. Um, so on behalf of the Sacramento Public Library, my name is Ricardo Ramirez. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Have a good afternoon and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Peace.